is his daughter, Aubrey Atwater Donnelly, and her husband, Elwood Donnelly, to bring us some wonderful, warming, wintering music. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. Fascinating. Good people prayed our petition. Your attention we beg and we crave. And if you are inclined for to listen, an abundance of pastime we'll have. Good people prayed our petition. Your attention we beg and we crave, and if you are inclined for to listen, an abundance of pastime we'll have. We've come to relate many stories concerning our four parents' time, and we trust they will drive out your worries. Of this we are all in one mind. Many tales of the poor and the gentry Of labor and love will arise There are no finer songs in this country In Scotland and Ireland likewise There's one thing more needing mention The dancers will dance all in fun So now that you've heard our intention We'll play on to the beat of the drum. I was thinking, boy, there's a, lot, there's, a lot of, there's a lot I want to tell you, and how all of what we're doing right now relates in some ways to the contents of the museum and to the Atwater family history. I learned to clog, that's American clogging, because I was interested in Southern Appalachia, the music and the culture, so I went down there more than 20 years ago. And the interest started when I was a little girl, because the Atwater Coal Company supplied coal to the Fall River knitting mills. My grandfather, my great-grandfather were involved with that. And they would talk about West Virginia. My father was born in Bluefield, West Virginia. So, so there's this, all this interesting kind of interrelatedness with all that we do. And it, and it makes you warm, too, when you clock. <laughs> so it'll be kind of like snapshots tonight. We'll just play different songs and uh, just give you a little background on some of the songs, where they came from. Some of them are very old. Here's a really old one. Just as we were getting ready to go today, I thought, oh yeah, we definitely have to do our nautical songs. We do a whole lot of different little subgenres of traditional American and Celtic folk music. This is a ballad, and as you might know, in folk music, a ballad tells a full-blown story. And it's about the golden vanity. And there are lots of variants of this song, which is thought to be about 400 years old. And it is a song of trickery, a, bit, a little bit of betrayal. A boy, a cabin boy volunteers to sink the enemy ship and then, well, he doesn't get 
what he was told he was going to get for doing that. So. And these have some very good singable choruses, so anytime you want to sing this evening, just jump in. <laughs> talked to Margo a few months ago, and then we came for a visit, I suddenly thought, you know, Elwood and I are cur curators too. I had never really used that word. But we've been uh, traveling and learning our psalms one by one through oral tradition. We, we really don't read music very well. We mostly learn the psalms when we meet people and, and get inspired by watching them play them. And um, we research them. The, the internet is wonderful for researching songs now. There are lots of variants of the, that one song we just did. There's dozens and dozens of variations of that song. And the, the fascinating thing about oral traditions is that some of the songs just make no sense because they were passed from person to person. And there's the, they're called the golden vanity. What, what's one of the merry golden tree or the merry willow tree? It's just some very strange uh, variants of the title. Now let's do another song 
along similar lines, but things don't end so badly. In folk music, it's hard to avoid tragedy, but it, it covers every topic of being human, and that's one of the things I actually love about these old songs. They leave no stones unturned. And this one is, it's fun to do sometimes when we do programs for young folks in schools, teenagers. This is about a 17 year old girl who disguises herself as a boy to, so that she can be a sailor. And um, I think this happened more than we'll ever know because back in those days, they didn't have to have physical examinations by doctors and frankly, that was a big help. Well, they just had to show up, right? <laughs> right, they just had to show up. And I think there are records where the girls would uh, just bind their bodies with a cloth to sort of, sort of straighten themselves out and, and, and pass as boys. And in all these stories, and there's a bunch of these songs and true stories out there, novels, books, history, historical accounts, something invariably would happen. The, 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 the sailor boy would get in a barroom fight and her shirt would get torn open, or, or the sailor boy would have a baby, or so, yeah, something would happen. So you'll see what happens here. And you can sing on this one too, it's a good singable one.
probably wondering what the heck this thing is. I was. <laughs> <laughs> this is an Appalachian mountain dulcimer, and this, uh, more than any instrument we play, is an American folk instrument. It is all of about 200 years old in its short history, and that's a very young instrument in terms of the history of instruments around the world. It's derived from a German zither-like instrument that in German dialect was called a Scheithole. And in German dialect, that meant firewood. It was, it was an instrument of the poorer classes, and it was not a very well-respected instrument, so they called it firewood. I didn't think that was very nice. But, um, and then how the, the German zither evolved into this, nobody quite knows, but it made its way down the wilderness trail into the Appalachian region of the United States. And until about five decades ago, it was not an instrument that ever would have been in a concert. It, it's, a, it's still a very quiet and subtle instrument. And this is, this is actually a large and rather chubby dulcimer compared to the, the ones in history. So it has a really interesting evolution in folk history. It's the, the Kentucky State Instrument. Who knew, right? <laughs> so let's, let's keep on the, the nautical theme and let's do a song about freezing to death. How's that? Appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> This is the story of, of Lord Franklin and uh, the Arctic explorer, and things didn't go so well for him at the end. Would you hand me my, my guitar will be fine because it's in the standard. Elwood and I go through a lot of wonderful phases. We, we've been playing this music together for 25 years. And, and we love it. it, it it's so full of variation. So many subgenres, so many fascinating stories and dances to learn that, that um, it has sustained our fascination all these years. And so we're, we're always in some kind of avid phase. And I, I will admit, I went through a Lord Franklin phase for a while. I, we're, we're both sort of insufferable when we're, when we're in these phases. But I believe there were two Nova specials on the, the story of Lord Franklin. Did any of you ever watch any of those? Um, and he and his crew apparently ate food from poorly canned tins that were that were canned with lead and so they started this is one theory they started to do all kinds of crazy things up there carrying big chests of, of furniture across the ice and just very, very odd signs of odd behavior once they finally did a track on track down their bodies and, the, and this is gruesome, but some of them were perfectly preserved in the ice and snow. So, so much later on, the, the scientists um, could, could get some understanding of what had transpired. But he was an Arctic explorer. And this song is in part, especially at the end, from the point of view of his wife, who, who said she would do just about anything to find him. Homeward bound one night on the deep, swinging in my hammock, I fell asleep. I dreamed a dream, and I thought it true concerning Franklin and his gallant. The hundred seamen he sailed away to the frozen ocean in the month of May to seek that passage around the pole where we poor seamen do sometimes go. 
ships his men they stroll. The ship on mountains of ice was drove. Where the Eskimo in a skin canoe was the only one who ever came. The fate of Franklin no one may know The fate of Franklin no tongue can tell Lord Franklin with his sailors do recycled melodies and folk music. Well, we've spent a lot of time in the landlocked places of the United States, particularly the Appalachian South and the Midwest. Those are wonderful places for folk music in America. And one thing that never ceases to, to fascinate me is, are the songs that you find that are traditional in those places. Like in, in a landlocked place like Eastern Kentucky, you would hear a seafaring song. So if you, if you think about the, the migrations of people, it makes total sense. It was the Scots-Irish and the English, among others, who came and settled and became the quote-unquote hillbillies. And so here's a song that comes from Missouri, and this is a seafaring song also. It's called Adieu, My Lovely Nancy. And it, if I understand the narration well, it's, it's maybe you can tell them. Is, it kind of, is he kind of bragging? He's trying to say that plowing the oceans is much more adventurous and dangerous than plowing the fields. So he's much better than a farmer. I think he's trying to say, or at least he's trying to brag to the lady. Yeah, he's showing off to his girlfriend. It's called Adieu, My Lovely Nancy, and I'll play a tin whistle for you. He'd probably be afraid because he was going off to sea, and the farmers would still be at home with his girlfriend. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a song about an insecure guy, is what it is. My lovely Nancy, ten thousand times a do. I'll be thinking of my own true love. I'll be thinking, dear, of you. Will you change your ring with me, my love? Will you change your ring with me? 
It'll be a token of our love I'm far at sea And I'm far away from home And you know that where I am Love letters I will write to you Every foreign strand When the farm boys return at night they will tell the girls fine tales Of all that they've been doing All day out in the fields Of the wheat and hay that they cut down Sure it's all that they can do While we bore jolly jolly hearts of old Just plow the seas all through And when we return again, my love To our own dear native shore Find stories we will tell to you How we plow the oceans all Houses to rain and the taverns they will roar and when our money it is all gone sure we'll go to sea for more
hardest thing I play. I want you to know that. I always feel like I'm gonna wreck at any minute when I'm playing that tune. <laughs> it's like you're on this runaway train. And that, that, that's the tin whistle, and that, that's a fascinating instrument too. I, I bet some of you are musicians and you know what the word diatonic means. Just, um, it's just like you just have the white keys of the piano, so you only have so many notes. And that's why I have so many different ones, because you need to collect all the keys if you want to be a versatile player. This is, this is a low D, it's just an octave lower than the one I just played. But this is a tin tin whistle, as opposed to an aluminum tin whistle, which is the one I just played. And these were also called penny whistles, but this is a very authentic old whistle that I got in Ireland 20 years ago. A rolled piece of tin soldered on the back with a wooden mouthpiece. This is a plastic tin whistle, and it looks a lot like a recorder, but it's not because it just has the six holes on top. Much different voice because it's made of a different material. And that's an, a key of E. This is the key of A. I taught myself, and so I found out later, I play backwards, <laughs> that the left hand typically goes on top. And the, so if I, if I want to play other wind instruments that have more keys, I would either need a left-handed one or um, I need to switch hands but this just has six holes on top, so it doesn't matter. And the amazing thing about the whistle and why I think it's so hard is because you, there's so much breathing going on, and if you breathe differently for any notes, you'll get different notes. Check this out. You're supposed to be amazingly impressed by that. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> and the one that I played originally, now, the, now mind you, these are tin penny whistles, and this is a $200 aluminum penny tin whistle. So. Make it look easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is a brass tin whistle, and they're getting higher and higher. This is the key of F, high F. This is the point where my fingers are starting to feel chubby. But wait, there's more. <laughs> the, the piece de resistance, the, the littlest one of all. It's so high pitched that actually humans can't hear it. <laughs> Put all the dogs around. <laughs> okay, I was kidding. banjo has a very fascinating history. It was a slave instrument, and this is an open back old time banjo. Historically, there are lots and lots of different versions of the banjo. The bluegrass banjos have a big wooden bowl on the back, a resonator. And this, this model is a historical a historic reproduction, but this was called the White Lady, because Boston, the banjo companies, were trying to get white ladies, to talk about direct <laughs> marketing, um, ladies, uh, the society ladies, to be interested in the banjo as a parlor instrument. I'm not sure how well that went over, because <laughs> even when I was a kid starting to learn folk music, my family was a little hesitant about it, and then they liked it, so. And the banjo didn't come over with the slaves. When, when we work with kids in schools, we often say, well, the slaves didn't have time to get their stuff, but they, they of course brought their culture and their musical instruments, their songs, their language with them, and the banjo evolved into this. So imagine 
that fusion of Celtic and English folk music with African rhythms, and therein is born much of American music. So how about some old-timey tunes from the Appalachian South, mixed with some French-Canadian foot clapping, and some limberjacks, which are a gift of Irish immigrant history. And we start rather proudly with the Rhode Island state bird, because we, we're native Rhode Islanders. I know, we cross state lines to be here. With the Rhode Island state bird, which was developed in Little Compton. Here goes. So we'll do one more song and we'll take a break. And we, we, did, we did bring all of our stuff that we've done over the years, our 12 recordings, our books, our Limberjacks, our film. And you guys, is your books, your gift shop open? Yeah, yeah the, the gift shop is open too. And thank you to 
to the folks here at the Marine Museum for asking us to come do this fundraiser. I also like to think of these as friend raisers too. <laughs> The last song we'll do before we take our little break is called The Mermaid from Ontario. And it's, it's a Shel Silverstein song. And I was thinking when we were doing that last number that it's interesting all the phases when we live long lives, all our many, many phases. And it's, it was an interesting year, 2012. Elwood and I moved clear across Rhode Island. We moved from Foster to Warren. I know, shocking as it sounds. What do you usually say? It took us all morning. <laughs> <laughs> but right around that time, uh, we moved. My, my Aunt Dicey died. She, she died last January at the age of 91. I think 91. And then my father died on June 1st. And my father was a character in Barrington and Warren. And it was an interesting convergence of many things because we moved to Warren and then I would mention my father and some of the older folks remembered him and would tell stories and things like that. So it was kind of neat. And then and then we called here and came out, came for a visit. And it's funny when you lose a loved one, you get more interested in their life in, in ways that you weren't before, I think. And so that, that happened to me. And then we had a memorial lunch at my house, at our house in Warren. And I thought, what can we sing that would be fun? My father really liked our concerts. And he would sit in the front row and be very happy. And we just did one about 10 months ago, and he was present. And then it was just a nice feeling. The next morning he woke up and said, I haven't felt this good in a long time. That's what music does to you, I think. But um, so we thought we need to sing something celebratory and funny, silly, joyous. The Atwaters were, were very funny people. They had very good, good language skills and very funny humor. Um, and so this is a Shel Silverstein song called The Mermaid from Ontario, the, the one we sang in the memorial. And you have a part. You have to sing uh, some echoing lines. It's kind of piratey kind of sounding song. Oh, the mermaid from Ontario. She had long green stringy hair, yo. A silly gown she'd wear, yo. But she had no one to marry, yo. No, she had no one to marry, yo. So that's how it's gonna go. Now this mermaid from Ontario. She loved a big mouth bass named Larry, yo. Who lived neat Lake St. Clair, yo. Under the St. Clair Ferry, yo. Under the St. Clair Ferry, She sent a seagull emissario to ask that big bass Lario if he'd consent to marry -o. If he'd consent to marry -o. Oh, no, 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 cried Lario. I'll not consent to marry -o. I'd rather sleep solitary -o. right here in my dairy area. -ary -ary you, you gotta do that again, because you didn't do that right. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 cried Lario. My life I will not share, yo. I'd rather live solitary, yo. Sit around in my underwear, yo. <laughs> right here on my dairy, yo. Right here on my dairy, yo. And you're so ordinary, yo. While I'm extraordinary, yo. I'm so debonary, yo. And I have a fine vocabulary, yo. Cause I memorized the fish dictionary, oh. Cause I memorized the fish dictionary, oh. And before I married you, I'd marry, oh, a Guernsey cow from the dairy, oh. Or eat a poison berry, oh. Or wind up with the fish dysentery, oh. Wind up with the fish dysentery, oh. Oh, me, oh, my, that's scary, oh. Oh, me, oh, my, that's scary, oh. Poor mermaid from Ontario. It was more than she could bear, oh. So she cried for a day.
We're chatters, so feel free to <coughs> chat with us. That was really old. <laughs> For my generation, people thought he was my grandfather sometimes. And um, he was very supportive in that British Reserve, New England, Yankee kind of way. He was very supportive. And later on, not just recently, I my cousin who's really into family history, he sent me he sent me a keynote address or a graduation speech that my great grandfather gave at, Durf, at Durfee High School in Fall River. Oh, wow. And I have a copy of it. And William C. Atwater, he was a he was a coal baron among other things, and so I guess he was invited, he was a, quite a businessman, he was invited to give the graduation speech. And he talked about um, the, the, the value of a, a college education for a woman, too. And this was still in the 19th century. So um, that, those are the kind of people I came from. And, uh, so my dad was uh, this is very subtly, very encouraging. And I just felt like I could do anything I wanted to do. It's a nice way to grow up. And he was also very generous with family history. I was always interested. But he knew that I had different politics than, than the, the older generation. And, and yet he still was very comfortable sharing with me. So when I think about the legacy of the Atwater Coal Company and the, the, the wealth that my grandfather, great-grandfather, amassed from those interests, all timber in Maine and shipping and the sugar in Cuba, the, the, they, they had their hands in a lot of things. So the Atwater Coal Company was just one of the many, many names of, of their companies. And so then I grew up and I went to Brown and we, you know, we were busy protesting everything. <laughs> so my father would share family history and then I'd write a song. And so this is, what, this is a song that I wrote and it took me, a, usually the songs when I was young would just pop out of me. But this is one that I wrote and I wanted to be thoughtful about it. I didn't want to just, just barrel into the subject because I, I didn't like knowing that my family got very wealthy on, at the expense of the land and the people in West Virginia. And we've spent a lot of time in Appalachia and it's considered to be a third world country. It's, it's, it's that devastated and that poor. And the issues of coal are still happening. So this was a song I wrote and it's called When I Go to West Virginia. The subtitle is Coal Mine Owner's Daughter.
Virginia with the coal from West Virginia. They were transported by train or truck, I would imagine, to Norfolk, Virginia. And then would they, those ships have, would have unloaded right over, over there. Is that, isn't that amazing? And then what was this? Was this a textile mill? Ironworks. Ironworks, okay. Isn't that amazing? So those, all that coal, all that coal was used to to fire up the mills here in Fall River? No, actually it was steam. Oh, steam here? Okay. And what about the textile mills? Steam. Steam? Now, what, what, what was the coal for? Coal. Homes. People's homes? Yeah. Well, some, yeah. Some yeah. Some yeah. Some yeah. Some. yeah. Really, it's really interesting to play these songs in Fall River. <laughs> I mean, just literally feet away from where those ships would unload the coal and the industry here. So, I, Elwood and I just love all the history we get to learn through these songs, the cultural history, the windows in, the little, the little glimpses in to people's lives, all kinds of people. So one of the heavily recruited uh, groups to work in Fall River, Woonsocket, and other places in New England were the French Canadians. So I often imagine being in a kitchen party on a Saturday night in a French Canadian community in southern New England, in a mill town, maybe like Hope, Rhode Island, Manville, Rhode Island, Woon Woonsocket. <laughs> So here's a chanson à répondre, a Québécois chanson à répondre. That's a call response song. So if you speak old French, 300 year old French, you just jump in. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just imitate yeah, yeah. it. <laughs>
Well, we, we have certain places we return to a lot in our career and get hired and rebooked, and we do a lot of teaching, too. We teach workshops on how to play the instruments or how to do the dancing. Elwood's a contra dance scholar, which is really fun. It's kind of similar to square dance in some ways. And um, so we, we teach a lot of things. And so sometimes we go to these festivals that last a week. And there's some in Kentucky, Arkansas, there's North Carolina. So we really get this wonderful sense of immersion in these places. Spent a lot of time in Western North Carolina, Eastern Kentucky, and North Arkansas. Those are three of our hot spots. <laughs> and um, North Arkansas is a very fascinating place. There's a town called Mountain View, Arkansas. And there's a state-run park, the Ozark Folk Center. And they have a wonderful stage that they run kind of like the Grand Old Opry a little bit. And it's, it's a neat experience. Wonderful traditional musicians. A lot of kids play. These, these little kids get up and they're amazing dancers, musicians, singers. But there was a, a songwriter up there that some of you may have heard of, Jimmy Driftwood. I bet you've heard of him, Margo. He, he wrote, I think he wrote like 3,000 songs. And he was a history teacher. He wanted the history to come alive for his students. So you were talking about doing a paper on the Santa Fe Trail, and, and so I, and you did cowboy songs for it. So here's a cowboy song from Arkansas from Jimmy Driftwood. His most famous song was uh, the Battle of New Orleans. Yes. <laughs> Come 
when he gives them a dare. I want a good horse that can run fast race and a crew that don't care where we go. We'll ride away off to some desolate place and sing Kaiyaki Kaiyo. from people they want to hire us and they, and they want us to do familiar songs and like, no, I don't think I'm, me to us. we're not your person we, we specialize in obscurity that's well we have an old dear friend who's been um, a great source of uh, information about the culture and the music of Appalachia her name is Jean Ritchie some of you may remember her. She came to New York City from the mountains of Kentucky in 1948 to work at the Henry Street Settlement School. She brought a dulcimer with her. And uh, that was in the end of that because the dulcimer is now gee, a household name in about a dozen households. <laughs> anyway, um, she's a great musician and a wonderful friend and she's been a good mentor for us for about 20 years now. And um, she wrote some great songs too. But this particular song I'm gonna do from her collection is actually a song that was sung for her parents when they were getting married, or just after they got married, around the wedding. And that was around 1895 when they got married. So this is a song called Foreign Lander. <coughs> Paradise to quench the golden chain. 
Her beauty and behavior None with her could compare But you, my dearest darling A more divinely fair I wish I was a turtle dove just fluttering from my nest. I'd sing so clear in the morning with the dew all on my breast. So sweetly would be the music, so doleful. So clear in the morning, in the beautiful month of June. I wish I was ten thousand miles, all lonesome, lonesome shore, or among the rocky mountains. The law, the lily of the eagle, and the little swallow too. I would give them all my dearest love if I was married to you. We were really still just bonding with that song. It took us a long time, but we, we got to record that for a compilation for Jean Ritchie that um, is going to help help her in her older years. So that's going to be released this year sometime. A bunch of people are on it. We don't we don't meet each other when we when we do these projects. Even Ju Judy Collins is on it, which is kind of exciting. We've never been on an album. <laughs> up our program for you and I'm going to do a little demonstration of, of the dancing I do so if you want to move to a different seat and see better don't be shy and move around around the building what around the building no <laughs> come on <laughs> yeah, you're not going to leave they don't want to pull a Lord Franklin tonight <laughs> especially to Margo and Tom and the folks here, Ginny and the other folks and MP, or the volunteers. It's great to meet you all. It's, it's very profound for me to be here tonight. It's, it means a lot to me personally. Thank you. I'm feeling my father a lot tonight. I don't know if you are, but I'm feeling him a lot. And he was very supportive of all the things I did in my life.
talk a little bit and tell you about this. You were asking how this differs from tap dance, and I'm going to show you. I started talking some years ago when I danced because nobody knew what I was doing. They thought it was tap dance. You see the difference? A little bit of cheaper too. Showy. It's bent over. You're using your arms a lot more. It's theatrical, that kind of thing. The dancing I do comes before tap dance on the timeline, and it's much more flat footed. In fact, the simplest version of this dance form is called flat footing. When I teach it, people say to me, Well, what do I do with my arms? I say, You're doing it. <laughs> There's not much. It's not like Irish step dance, which is stiff. This is my fake Irish step dance routine. <laughs> but you get the idea with Irish step dance. It's much more rigid upper body. Irish is very technical and in the last hundred or so years incredibly competitive. American clogging is also called buck dancing, jig dancing, flat footing. And there is a certain kind of American flogging that is competitive and team-oriented, choreographed, and that's the kind I don't do. But that looks a little more like this. And people wear uh, uniforms and they wear white shoes and something called jingle taps. And I do something older that's a freestyle dance form. And I learned to dance on the road the last 20 years. Many people who did this dance form and asking them to show me steps. So every step I do has a story to it. These first three steps were the ones I learned when I first went to Eastern Kentucky in 1992. This is called the buck step, or the two-sounded walking step. I'm going to move this a little bit. I didn't like the part of the floor I was on. I kept kind of tripping. That same year I learned the chug, which is thought to come from the slaves, West African movement, and the Indian comes out of Cherokee ceremonial dance. And I've been told by Native American dancers that this rhythm only exists in Hollywood. <laughs> so those steps were the first ones I learned and I just danced those for a long time. I used leather sole shoes, which was common in the olden days. These dance forms evolved in environments where people wore leather sold shoes and they worked and lived in buildings with wooden floors. Like English clogging. In that case they were wooden clogs in the linen mills and a whole competitive dance form evolved in England because of the industry. So over time I would meet dancers like I learned the three sounded walking step. Here's the two sound again. And the three sounds sound like this. And then later, the four-sounded walking step, which is also known as the Tennessee walking step, and the time step around which this entire dance form revolves. The old timers in the southern United States sometimes would call this talking feet, because you're telling stories with your feet. So like, for example, I met this woman named Tamara Lowenthal in Indiana once, who said, well, if you would add and subtract elements of this step, you create little stories with your feet, like, I'll take out the right toe sound. The left heel. The right heel. The left toe. And now I'm back to the two sound walking step. Put it all back in. Substitute the right toe with a shuffle. I'm just interested in making as many sounds with my feet as possible. So I learned all these steps from different people, like the scissors from these friends in Arkansas. And the silent scissors. I learned the Applejack in North Carolina. Slide. 
that's really fun. <laughs> in North Georgia, I met these kids who showed me the wonder of spaces in dance and music. Charlie Burton in Pennsylvania showed me the gallop. And 13-year-old Caleb Cobb in Arkansas said, add a step in there, it looks Irish. <laughs> Dancer April Birch in Ottawa Valley does the chug and then she does this. So I met the Canadian dancers too, and they danced a little more on their toes. Prince Edward Island, Peter Patter. The Cape Breton broke an ankle. So just a little, little piece of this here, a little piece of that there. And then I would come back home to Rhode Island and practice. Practice, 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 practice. I had no idea how much training goes behind improvisation. Not knowing what you're going to do till the split second you do it. it. Takes hours and hours and hours of training. So I would dance and train myself by myself in our barn. We lived on an 18th century farm in Foster for 15 years and we just moved last year. I'd go into the barn. Sometimes it would be days like this, it would be really cold. And I'd go out there, practice, concentrate, you get pretty warm fast. One time I was seeing how fast I could go. I stopped, and on the quiet road outside the barn, I heard this. <laughs> You're getting better! <laughs> and it was this wise guy that used to do a while loop on his bike every day, he'd been monitoring my progress for weeks. <laughs> and then fast forward a couple years later, this young couple moved into the log cabin next door to us, but next door in the country is far away. You'd go through the field in the woods and there was the log cabin. So we didn't meet them for a whole season. When we did meet them, they said, we thought you were building an addition for the longest time. <laughs> but no building ever went up. <laughs> And then another time I was leaving the barn and a guy was jogging by and he said, were you exercising horses in there? <laughs> and that is our show for you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>